Welcome back to the third and final episode of our Maersk and Containerization series. My name is Charlotte and I'm a historian here at Maersk and I'm joined again by my colleague Henning. Hi, this is Henning. We're really looking forward to covering the milestones of the Maersk history in containerization. This time from the financial crisis years of 2008 until today. The financial crisis in 2007 and 2008 stemmed from the housing crisis in the US and following that uh, consumers uh, stopped spending, uh, broadly speaking, which of course had a, a tremendous impact on imports uh, and therefore also an impact on the volumes in mass clients. We saw a drop of 25% in volumes in 2009, resulting in a very bad result for, for uh, mask line itself, but certainly also for the AP Muller mask group as a whole. Very few things were there to, to lighten the day. Uh, one was the introduction of, of Emma mask, uh, at the time the largest uh, container vessel in the world, uh, capacity of more than 15,000 TU. And uh, strangely enough, I remember clearly that, that this, this new vessel overshadowed uh, some of the problems uh, in, in the day-to-day -day work because uh, you know people were not happy during that time but then suddenly this light came out of uh, the Odense steel shipyard that we were again the largest uh, container carrier in the world but uh, no it was a very problematic time for 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 mask in that period on the back of the P&O Netloid acquisition and the financial crisis, uh, Mask experienced a loss in 2009. We uh, saw a, a loss of 25% of volumes in Mask line, which of course resulted in, in a loss. But then again, the next year, everything turned around and 2010 was a record year, uh, not only for Mask, for, but for shipping uh, around the world. So um, at this time, uh, mask line and APM terminals were among the t four large businesses in the AP Muller Mask Group. Uh, the other two large businesses were within energy, uh, and uh, we had some smaller businesses among them Damco, uh, a, f a freight forwarder, uh, supply chain management company. Uh, but but the conglomerate of the AP Muller Mass Group um, was growing uh, during these years. Uh, we were focusing on, on growing world-class businesses, as it was said. Uh, and um, later in the decade, in, in 2014, 2015, the management started looking at the structure of, of the group, whether that would be the right structure for the, for the future. And uh, that brings us very quickly uh, to 2016. <clears throat> yes, because in 2016 we launched uh, a new strategy um, because it became apparent that this uh, vast range of different I industries was, uh, was an obstacle for the continued sustainable growth. Um, so it, would, it was decided to dismantle the conglomerate and divest all related activities that we had. Um, instead becoming a fully integrated container logistics uh, company. So most tankers were sold to AP Muller Holding, uh, most oil was sold to Total, and uh, most drilling became a separately listed company in 2019. In our last episode, we covered the P&O Netloid acquisition, and um, we talked about how haunting the experience was. And I'm thinking specifically uh, when we um, acquired Hamburg Süd in 2017. I think you're right in bringing that up in the sense that uh, we have actually learned a lot. Uh, there was uh, uh, a lot of people who uh, were in the organization in 2005 and 2006 and experienced the P&O Netloid uh, acquisition and um, the integration uh, of P&O Netloid systems, people, customers, uh, and we all remembered how that went. So we certainly wanted to learn from that. And uh, a great emphasis from top down was was put in the uh, on the acquisition of Hamburg Süd to ensure that uh, again systems, people, vessels, everything was integrated into Mask uh, in an orderly fashion according to a plan. 
And uh, I think it's safe to say that it actually uh, succeeded uh, in doing that. So it's a great example of, uh, yeah, you make a mistake and then you learn from that and make it right. Um, becoming the global integrator of container logistics were the goals set out in 2016. And this required a large transformation in terms of how we operate as a company. The organization was transformed to become more integrated and a huge digital transformation was also launched to move away from the previously more analog approach. So now we are focusing on building these three world-class divisions on within logistics and services, ocean, and also terminals that all have very strong synergies with the, between, between them. So what, one of the catchphrases of the new strategy was that now we can help our customers end-to-end -end or all the way. And uh, that was illustrated in, in many different ways. One of them, or oh, actually my, my, my favorite one, is a circle where we start at the top Uh, by contacting the customer and then we help the customer moving whatever is needed to be moved all the way to wherever it needs to be moved to. And looking at that circle at the very bottom, you see the container being moved from one terminal to another terminal uh, on the oceans. And that is, of course, historically uh, our core business. And uh, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, we have been active in land-based uh, logistics since 1977, when a company called Mercantile was established in uh, Taiwan and Singapore. Uh, it's fair to say that this activity, uh, the logistics side of, uh, of the business, has always been underfinanced in MASC. We have made several attempts uh, to, uh, to enlarge that business, but um, many reasons uh, led to that this has never really been a focus area for us. I think uh, one could argue that, that culturally uh, Mask has been a shipping company and uh, that it has been a difficult exercise for the organization to focus on, on the land-based uh, uh, operations. So the, the change in, in MASK since uh, 2000. yeah, 2016 is also a cultural exercise mm. that, that we start uh, to look at uh, ourselves, of course, first, uh, but also at the customer's needs uh, all the way. Mm. So uh, as our chairman at the, the time said, you know, we have 70,000 customers. Why not ask them for a little bit more of their business? And that is basically, uh, very simply put, sorry, uh, very simply put, that, that what we're doing, we're utilizing our customer base, the knowledge that we have with uh, those customers to uh, expand our business with them. And that, of course, also includes IT. And IT is, um, is very much uh, in our focus at the moment. We are really transforming uh, the organization Um, some will know that we had a company called Mass Data started in 1970. Uh, and some have said, we are building up a new Mass Data. And that is partly true uh, in terms of numbers of people, in terms of the activity that, uh, that the technology uh, colleagues are, are, are doing. That is, that is certainly partly true. But it's also a, a realization that uh, more now than uh, more than ever, Uh, IT is, is really core to, to our business, but but it has been with us since the very beginning. You know, when we started containerization in 1975, or actually in 1973, when the decision was made, a couple of people were taken out of mass data and put into the mass line organization to establish the first systems, as they were called, uh, to um, keep track of the containers, to keep track of uh, customers' uh, ca uh, cargo data. Uh, and those systems have developed uh, as the need has, has grown over time. But, but it has been part of our business since the very beginning. We, we were among the, the largest uh, operators of satellite-based data transmission in the late 1970s and uh, early 1980s, where we also established our own email system, which was not really an email system, more a chat function, as we would call it today. Mm -hmm but very effective uh, communication between uh, our offices uh, around the world. But would it also be fair to say that uh, since then, 
Um, and until now, uh, the shipping industry as a whole has been a little bit behind on 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 that focus area. I think there's a general acceptance that uh, shipping was n- has never been a first mover in, in the use of IT in many ways, uh, especially perhaps the the customer facing IT. And uh, when when speaking of that, we also have to remember that when we you know, one of the, the phrases that were used in Mask in, in like, I think, 2011, 2012, that uh, it should be as easy to book a container as it is to book a plane ticket. Uh, fair enough. But we also have to take into account that our customers' needs are very, very different. Our customers are very, very different. They are on um, different continents, uh, in countries that are, some are very developed, some are less developed. Uh, the need to move a container is still the same. Uh, when we did the uh, the um, uh, measurement of how many documents are actually needed to move a container from, I think it was from Nairobi to Amsterdam, and uh, how many authorities, partners, uh, institutions are involved in that movement of one container, uh, it also showed the need for a more uniform system, uh, which then led to the development of uh, blockchain uh, or utilization of blockchain uh, technology, which again is a very fairly new technology that is, of course, taking some time to spread out uh, to not only uh, mask, but also to our competitors, to our partners and authorities. But um, it is one of those initiatives that have taken us out of not being at the forefront of IT, certainly. Uh, but it takes a lot, uh, many things to, to uh, combine the efforts of uh, of the many parties that that are in the movement of one container. And then we move around 11 million containers every year, so you can just add up the complexity. And those 11 million represent around 20 percent market share. Yes, and uh, it's a big number. Uh, Mask has established itself as one of the three largest. Uh, container carriers of the world. Um, We say that we sail with around 720 container vessels right now, every day. Uh, We say that these uh, 720 uh, container vessels make around 90,000 port calls every year. That's also a very big number. If you take that number, 90,000, divided by 365 days, and then that number with 24 hours, it makes a port call somewhere in the world by a mask vessel every six minutes. And that's that's a staggering fact, uh, showing the uh, enormity uh, of world trade today, uh, considering that we have only nearly 20% of of the the market share. Uh, So there's still 80% out there, uh, adding up to those six, uh, every six minutes, and uh, it is a very complex world that we are operating in, uh, trying to move things uh, to be on time. Uh, we have had several discussions uh, over the past uh, couple of years since the unfortunate uh, incident in the Suez Canal where the uh, Evergreen vessel was stuck uh, for, for a week and the implications of that. That also shows how well we have optimized the supply chains uh, over the past 20, 30 years, utilizing all the things that we've been talking about. But perhaps also, uh, as some customers have said, we might want to relax that a little bit now. We have optimized, but also found a level where uh, a a small occurrence in a port in China or in the Suez Canal can disturb uh, our supply chain. Mass today is a cornerstone in the global supply chains. Uh, we have joked that if Mask goes on vacation, if we all of us, all 80, 90,000 colleagues go on vacation for two weeks, it can actually be felt in the supermarkets of the world because the supply chains are so optimized today. That also shows that that we have uh, a big responsibility uh, in how we operate. And uh, I think one of the the great things that have happened over the past few years is our continued focus 
on, on, uh, on our role in, in sustainability, uh, taking responsible to, uh, responsibility to, to change our footprint uh, as a provider of, um, of logistics. Uh, that goes from ordering new vessels, but also uh, ordering trucks that are electrical, optimizing our warehouse operations um, so that, that we are a good citizen uh, of the world. So there is still more work to be done. There is still more work to be done. And uh, I think uh, the past five years is really a great period uh, in the history of mask in containerization, uh, which we can look back to uh, in 10 years time and uh, make a new podcast yes. about that. Let's do that. Let's do that. This concludes our third and final episode of our Merck in containerization series. I want to thank you so much for joining me, Henning. Thank you very much for having me, Charlotte. And I hope you all enjoyed listening in on this little segment of Maersk history. If you would like to know more about the Maersk history, please go to maersk.com. Go to the bottom of the front page. There's the About section. And in there, you'll find uh, a timeline uh, of our history. You'll find articles about the heritage. Also, do follow Maersk on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media where we post regularly about the heritage. Thank you very much.